goal that Edmonton has had since 2008 is to divert 90% uh, of the material away from the landfill, which was, when it was established, was a very ambitious goal. <laughs>
even though it shows up on this graph as being a very small fraction, uh, when you see millions and millions and millions of grocery bags that are littering the environment, that's very meaningful to us. Uh, so just like Andy's graphic here, I too had a composition uh, graphic that I wanted to share. And it's very similar to what uh, you're seeing in your program here in Devon. Um, I combined, because we only have the black bag for garbage right now, so that's our organics and our garbage in one container. And so that means that our yard waste and our food waste is a lot higher in that. And you can see again, there's some recycle in there and there's some misplaced items, household hazardous waste like batteries and electronics. So this is where most of that material goes. This is the Waste Management Center. It's located just on the northeast corner of the city. And it's a pretty big facility. Uh, there's about 16 different unique operations there that we have. Uh, it is about 430 hectares and, sorry, 233 hectares. And each week we receive about 4,000 loads of material of various types of material. Um, the ones that are meaningful for the residential program that are the most important to the program, if you want to go to the next slide, um, these three facilities here. So number one is the facility where we receive the black bag garbage. Number two is our compost facility. And then number three is our recycling facility, the material recovery facility. So those comprise the major components of how we handle household garbage. And that's where most of it's going. Uh, we have a big red circle there at the compost facility because that building, that roof that I've circled, is not in good shape. So if anybody's heard that our composter is shut down, that's because uh, our engineers about two years ago identified that that roof is no longer structurally sound and it might collapse when it's got a load on it. So knowing that, we can't put people in that building. Uh, we've had to shut down operations. Um, we were running it temporarily in the summer because when there was no snow on it, it seemed like it was okay, but we recently found out that it's actually much worse and so we've had to shut it down uh, immediately. So we're now in the process of tearing that building down and then we're gonna start making some changes and hopefully building a new composting facility uh, within the next few years. The building here with the green circle, coincidentally, uh, we've added that. We started construction for that facility about five years ago and that's called an anaerobic digester, which is another type of composting facility. It's a different technology, it's a newer technology, uh, and it's, very, it's increasingly common in the composting industry that uh, facilities are using digestion as opposed to the traditional type of composting, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later. So next. Oh, and the problem with that facility, the one that I just highlighted there in green, is that it was built back when we thought that the big composter was okay, and so it's not designed to take all of the material for Edmonton's program. It's only designed to take about uh, a third of the total volume. So composting looks pretty straightforward, right? Um, the interesting thing about the Edmonton program, and I think one thing that you can take away from this uh, in relation to Devon's program is all of our food waste, all of our yard waste, all of our grass goes into a black bag, a garbage truck. It goes to our waste processing facility. We separate the material and then it goes to the composting facility and then it goes out to the curing site. And this here is what that compost looks like after we've gone through all of the work. And what you can see right away is a lot of plastic material in that. And so the reason is because that within the sorting systems we have, they're just not able to separate the plastic and other materials, batteries, glass, uh, these sorts of things. So in the end, we have a a compost product, we can use that for things like land remediation, but we can't use that for residential purposes. You're not gonna use that in your garden. Uh, you're not gonna sell that to a farmer. And so that's really important uh, why a lot of municipalities now have separate collection for their organics, because it allows when you have a much cleaner product, like Andy showed, in your organics, you only have 2% contamination. It's much easier, it takes less work. It's environmentally friendly because now you can do, you can create compost with a smaller facility uh, and less carbon footprint. Next. So this is the new uh, composting facility that we have. It's called the High Solids Anaerobic Digestion. Uh, and what that means is that it's a dry facility. We don't use water, which traditionally when you're using composting facilities, you use a lot of water. And that takes a lot of energy, uh, both to remove later, but also to heat up. And so that, in comparison, the benefits of this facility are that it's much more environmentally friendly because 
Uh, it doesn't use the same water, and the energy requirement is significantly less. Um, so this was designed for organics, like Devon has, clean separated organics. And then what we basically do is we introduce uh, bacteria into the system, a uh, very high bacteria count, and accelerate that digestion and turn the material. Uh, and then it comes out to a digestate that we can use as a fertilizer. And the other benefit with digesters, as opposed to a traditional composting system, is that you also capture the waste heat and the energy off of that to create electricity. Uh, and so that's why one of the reasons uh, a lot of municipalities now, when they're building compost facilities, they build digesters, uh, primarily because of the reduced carbon footprint. The system is generally more efficient. When you look at the size of that facility from the previous picture, uh, it's much, much smaller than the, the big, massive composter that we used to have. A uh, really good comparison that I was just looking at a facility in Ontario, uh, and they have what's called a wet digester. It's the same idea, but they use water in the system, and then they create a liquid fertilizer afterwards. Uh, their facility is only 3.5 acres. It's not a big plot of land, uh, and they process over 100,000 tons of material per year. So that's about 70% of the same amount of material that our big facility processed, uh, and that facility was about the size of six hockey rinks. The other nice thing, uh, it's okay, we can leave it. So the other nice thing that I'll mention about the digestion systems, uh, I'll talk again about this one in Ontario. So they take material from different municipalities, uh, including York and Peel and Toronto, um, and when they're finished with that material, and it's often much more contaminated than the material that you have, when they're finished, they have a liquid fertilizer that they have certified by the province that can be used on farms for organic farming. So it's a much cleaner product, much more usable product. I'm not sure, is this question okay specific to that digester? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't know a ton about it, but uh, I'll pretend. What's the uh, energy that comes out of it? Is that methane gas? Yeah. Uh, so it's all, I'm going to say generally that I know that it's captured, but I don't know it's how it's being handled. Uh, so there's two methods of energy capture. There's the, there's the heat capture, which is then being recirculated into the, that building and other buildings that we have to provide heat for the operations. And then it also creates electricity off of the uh, methane. So this is our recycling facility. Uh, that is our receiving area there the blue bag material, and then this is where we have the processing and sorting of the material. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the process that we have here just to give people a sense of how the machinery works and you can kind of understand about how some of these challenges arise in, in terms of quality and the things that we can and can't take. You can go to the next slide. So this describes, and this was actually a video, but I'm, unfortunately the video doesn't work so you're just going to have to pretend. Uh, but this machine here is shown in this diagram, uh, and this is called a screen or a disc screen. It's a very common type of machinery used in the waste industry. It's used for recycling, it's used for composting, it's used for waste handling. Uh, and what it does is you use different configurations, different sizes, different uh, shapes, and it will separate the material based on the size. Uh, and sometimes it can be used to separate material based on other characteristics like weight. Uh, the reason why in the industry we have some challenges, in particular in recycling, is when you have material that is approximately the same size and physically behaves similarly, so think a piece of paper and a plastic bag, they tend to go to the same place in these types of machines. And so even after you've done the sorting, you still have a lot of that material mixed together that you need to handle in some other way. Next. So the way that we handle the material is we use those disc screens that I was showing you. We've got about three of those to separate the material. Uh, and then primarily for us, we use sorters to capture that material. Um, and they're doing quality control to remove the contamination from the products. And they're also doing uh, recovery where they see good material and they take that and throw that off to the side. Um, our facility is in a different position than a lot of others in the, in the area, GFLs in particular, because this facility was built in 1998, uh, and the technology, the system hasn't really changed significantly since then. And so we don't have optical sorters. Um, all of the recovery of plastic is done by a person watching and making a decision on whether or not to pull that piece of plastic. 
which is generally good for us because we can, we can be very specific about the material that we want. Uh, but the downside is that we recover less uh, than other municipalities that have new technology because a machine, an optical sorter, can make decisions much more quickly. So this is what's in our blue bag recycling. Um, this was based on our composition for 2018. I combined all the data. And what we know is that we, we recycled, we sent to market about 27% cardboard, 27% paper, a little bit of plastic, a little bit of metal, and a lot of what we call residue. And residue is the leftover material that it's a combination of contamination, that it's garbage, it's non-recyclable plastic, or in some cases it's good material that the system isn't able to properly sort. So going back to that disk screen talking about how material sometimes doesn't go where it should, uh, that's an example there where that material ends up as residue because the system can't send it to the correct destination. Uh, a really big contributor to the residue. So we know that our contamination in the blue bag is about 25%, which is, it's noticeably higher than Devon has. Uh, there's a variety of factors that, that play into that. Um, in addition to that, the other major part of that residue is small material that the system can't sort properly. As soon as it gets uh, kind of smaller than the palm of my hand, at that point, the system can't effectively separate that material out. And it's very likely that it's going to go to the wrong place or it's going to go into our residue bin, which then goes to landfill. Um, again, it's important that we measure this information and we understand our performance in these programs. Uh, but a lot of times when we look at this, if we, if we were to say, ah, I'm doing pretty good, I'm recovering 27% of my paper, that's great. Uh, it tends to devalue our discussion around the smaller items like plastic and metal. Uh, and those are still important things for us to consider, even though they don't represent a large portion of the pie, uh, we still need to make sure that we're maximizing the recovery of those items. So this is our garbage. Uh, so if you think about everything that you would put into your organics and everything you put into your recycle, um, this is the, the black bag garbage that we process at our waste management facility. And you can see some food waste, some plastics, there's a water bottle and some Crocs, a uh, really dirty ketchup bottle, a glove. All of this material gets sorted, again using a disc screen, same technology, um, and it gets sent to either the composter or it goes to our biofuels facility called Enerchem, which we're going to talk about. Um, and the challenge that we've seen, again, is that the system can't effectively sort all of the contamination, and so we end up having some of that plastic and some of that material uh, mixed into the compost and the organics. Next. So the, the non-organic material, the plastics that can't be recycled, um, that material is what we want to use for our biofuels program, which is this lovely facility right here. What we do is we take all of the, the material that can't traditionally be recycled, and we also take the residue, the leftover stuff from our recycled facility and the leftover stuff from our composting process. So if you saw that, that pile in the photo earlier with the plastics, that material can be used in this system. What we do is we remove any of the contamination from that, which in this case is just things that aren't going to break down in the uh, thermal process of gasification. So usually metal, rocks, uh, electronics, those are the things that we're gonna get out of that. And then we shred the material down to about two inches in size, and it's sent over to this lovely facility here called Enerchem. Uh, so this big chamber right here is called a gasification chamber. And the basic idea is it's a massive oven. You turn up the heat to about 1,000 degrees Celsius. And at that temperature, it's going to cause the material to start to break down into its basic components. Uh, and then what they do is they capture the carbon off the top of it. And the only thing that's left over is uh, a little bit of residue, the stuff that doesn't burn like rocks and metals. Uh, so it's a fully contained system to capture all of the, the liquid waste, all of the off-gassing that occurs in it. Once they've gasified the material, at that point it's basically just a refinery. And now what they're doing is taking that carbon and treating it and cleaning it to make a reusable product. Um, once you have that, you can do a variety of things with it. Um, you can make diesel, you can make methanol, you can make ethanol, you can make electricity too. Uh, and what these guys have chosen to do here is they make ethanol because it's a high value product. Uh, the great thing about ethanol is that 
you know, we often hear about it being used in fuel, uh, and it is good for that purpose, but it's also used in plastic manufacturing. Um, ethanol is one of the inputs that you use to make new plastic, and so that promotes that idea of a circular system where you are taking these plastic products and then you're feeding it back into plastic production. So that's the, the Edmonton system, kind of at a, an overview. And now what I'll talk about is some of the, what's going on in the industry right now. And we've already been kind of touching on these things throughout the night tonight. So everybody's well aware of these issues that we've been talking about within the recycling industry. Um, and I think that's really good that we're having these discussions here and we're seeing that increasingly across the globe. Um, what we've observed, what we all know at this point, is that it's costing more to recycle now than it used to. Um, the material is cleaner than it used to be because the expectation from the buyers has gone up. And so that's why the cost has gone up largely, is because it takes more work to get a better product that can be recycled. And then also in addition to that, like you've seen and like you've talked about, there's a narrowing list of what is and isn't accepted within the program because processors are saying, I can't handle this material, it doesn't really work, and it's not ending up as a recyclable product that they can use. So a really good example is glass. Uh, I totally understand why people are concerned about glass because it is a reusable product, um, and it should be recycled or recovered, but it's very challenging when we introduce it into a system like this. The reason is, um, as soon as you take a glass jar or anything like that, and you throw it in a garbage truck, there's a really good chance it's gonna break. Um, and then at the facility too, when you think about the conveyors and the machinery, again, it's probably gonna break. Uh, and that totally changes what you can do with the material because now I can't have a, a new jar. Um, and once it's broken down into these small pieces, it's really hard to separate from the other material, uh, small pieces of paper and other things like that. And so you can recycle glass, but you can't turn it into, you can't take a glass jar and turn it into a new glass jar. What happens is you can take a glass jar and you can turn it into a sandblasting medium. So that's what some places are doing. Calgary is doing that right now. Um, and it has to come at a cost because they don't get money for that. They pay somebody to take that material. Um, so they are diverting that material and it is going for a beneficial reuse, but it's economically very challenging to one, install the right equipment to recover that material and then two, to find a buyer that's willing to accept and to handle the material. So uh, most people are probably aware of the announcement that the Liberal government made a couple weeks ago talking about, was it last week, I think? Um, talking about material bans. And so they said, we're gonna ban single-use plastics, which is generally really good to hear. We don't know yet what that means because they haven't said what's on that list and that's gonna be very meaningful. Um, and it also depends on whether or not it's an outright ban and we say you can't even make plastic bags or if they say yeah you can you can use a plastic bag but we're gonna charge you 20 cents or 25 cents for it as uh, so economic incentives instead so what that looks like is going to be very meaningful because that's going to drive the behavior about consumption of these items um, it's important as well as we go through this process, and the, and the people that are working on this are, are aware of these things and very good at this, but it's worthwhile to be aware of the fact that when you say, don't use a straw, okay, that's fine. What am I gonna use instead? Do I have a product, a replacement product that I can use that's effective um, and that has a uh, sustainable end use? So a good example is replacing a grocery bag with a reusable canvas bag. Um, and I fully encourage people to do that. That's one of the great things that you can do to reduce your footprint. But it's important to recognize that it takes more energy. The carbon footprint of creating one reusable bag is significantly more than it does for a plastic bag. And so you have to use that, that reusable bag many, many times to recover the value as opposed to a plastic bag. Uh, when we talk about uh, banning single-use plastics and banning other materials, it's worthwhile to note that it can be done at any level of government. Um, it can be more challenging to have that discussion and to have it uh, successful, but you've seen municipalities do this, you've seen provinces do this, uh, the European Union is working on this, and so it doesn't have to be any one group. Um, it's up to a variety of regulators to decide who is involved in that discussion and what that's gonna look like. Um, generally speaking, I think that there's 
a lot of value in having a consistent approach across a larger group. And so if it's introduced for the country as a whole, I think that would be much better than if it's introduced for uh, individual municipalities where it might change from city to city. Um, some other really good examples of material bans are in Ontario, the provincial government, the Liberal government, announced a little while ago that they were going to ban organic material from the landfill. And so um, you're not allowed to put organics in your garbage. Now that's not in place yet, uh, but that is still, looks like it's going to be in place in the near future. And that's going to have an impact on behavior and cost of operations as people now have to find other ways of handling that material. And it's going to create more composting operations and more material available to use for fertilizer. Oh, and Calgary also did that as well. Uh, if you're familiar with Calgary's implementation, uh, I believe it was in 2016, they announced that they were gonna do a, a bylaw on organics. And what they said was, if you throw your garbage out at the landfill, um, it costs $115 a ton, but if we find organic material in there, we're gonna charge you $180 a ton. Uh, and so that again is just trying to change that behavior using an economic incentive to encourage people to sort the material properly so that it's going to the right system. So again, this was the other major announcement from the Liberal government, extended producer responsibility. Uh, it's a fancy word, but the basic idea is that the people that make these things, uh, ketchup bottles, straws, bags, all these things, when you make something, you should be responsible for what happens to it when you're finished and making sure that it does have, one, can it be recovered? And two, is there someone that wants to buy it and use it? Um, there are, we call them EPR, uh, there are EPR programs in the country. Uh, BC has a good one. Ontario's got a good one. Um, Alberta doesn't have an EPR program. Uh, it seems like with the announcement from the federal government that that's going to help drive the discussion forward. Uh, but that's a big gap for us right now because that we don't have the same level of program that we do in other, other provinces in the country. Um, Christina was here at the beginning of the year talking about the circular economy and talking about EPR. Um, and I, f I agree with her completely in regards to the benefits of EPR. I think that that's the necessary next step for the recycling programs to improve. Um, but they're not perfect. And what I mean is, as soon as you have an EPR program in place, we're not finished. We still have waste to handle and we still have things that are not recyclable that are not part of that EPR system. So. The EPR program right now, the way that it's been designed is that it handles what's in the, the blue bag program. But if that group, that group of producers say, we're not gonna handle, um, we're not gonna handle blue bags, then they just end up as waste. They're not part of the EPR program. And therefore we continue to have this material that's in the system, but it's not being managed within that. So it's up to the government to decide how comprehensive the regulation needs to be to capture all of this material. <clears throat> so talking about what's next in the waste industry, um, a lot of really good discussion tonight within this group about reducing our waste uh, and reusing things so that we reduce the burden on the system and reduce the carbon footprint because one of the best things that you can do is don't generate that waste in the first place then you don't have a truck picking it up, you're not processing the material, and you're not shipping it off to wherever. Can you give me a glass of water? <coughs> Thanks, Andy. Uh, Andy touched on this earlier about how it's hard to measure diversion. When you start, when you don't generate waste, you can't measure it. Um, we, in Edmonton, we promote mulching uh, and that's very important because that's a huge benefit to the system. Um, grass right now represents about 60,000 tons per year for us. And as you saw earlier in the graphic, it's a big chunk of that material. So the more people that grass cycle, that mulch, the less work is required on the system and the less energy is consumed in composting and recovering these products. One of the great benefits of uh, of reducing your waste and changing your collection schedule to bi-weekly collection is that when you have less material to collect, now the, the garbage truck um, has to drive less. And so going to bi-weekly collection, for example, just generally speaking, the truck is on the road half of the amount of time. 
And so immediately you've vastly improved the, the exhausts, the emissions from that vehicle uh, and all the costs associated with operating it. Next. <laughs> yeah. It's high quality Devon water. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does taste wonderful, I'll say that. So waste to energy systems, that's the Enerchem system that I showed earlier in the graphic. Um, we call it biofuels, it's called Enerchem because that's the company. It's waste to energy. And I refer to it here as the missing link in diversion because it takes, it's designed to capture all of that material that the recycling and the organics programs can't handle. Um, both the black bag garbage, but also the, the residue from the recycling system because we know that there's, we know there's contamination in there and we know there's material that the systems just don't get. And so all of that material, if we looked earlier at that 41% residue from the recycle facility, all of that could be used in the waste to energy program. The, the biggest um, challenge is the upfront cost of setting up a system like this. It is very expensive. It's hundreds of millions of dollars for a facility that size. Um, so the, the requirement can be very challenging to get there to achieve a, uh, a different program like that. Um, yeah, and that's, it's good because it, it allows us to reuse that material that traditionally has no end market. And like I mentioned earlier, you can use that for a variety of things like ethanol production. The last thing that I think is really important that a lot of times we forget about is to improve the waste management industry. We're having really good discussions about where we are right now today, and that's really good, but we're generally talking about household waste um, and the things that we do in our houses. We've, we've got a pretty good understanding of that now. Um, most people have been recycling for a long time, but what we don't do a very good job of is recycling commercial waste, industrial waste. Household garbage, if you look across the country, household garbage accounts for about one third of the material that we put in a landfill. And in Alberta, that's actually uh, different because of the large industrial sector that we have. Uh, in Alberta, it's about 25, 75. And this is very meaningful when we think about, as we get in discussions about our environmental impact uh, and stewardship of the environment, we need to recognize that it's not just about the household, but it's about everything that we do uh, comprehensively. And the challenge, the reason why we're like that right now is that because there is very little regulation within the <coughs> private sector. Um, there's things about hazardous waste and, and things like that that are clearly harmful, but generally speaking, in, Al in Alberta, um, it's very cheap to send garbage to landfills, and there's no, little to no economic incentive to divert commercial or industrial material. Yeah, and then, like I said, a good example of municipalities getting into the discussion about trying to regulate the private sector was Calgary's bylaw, which they introduced a couple of years ago, that this applies to the private sector that says, if you're a restaurant, if you're anybody operating a business, you have to manage your organic waste. And so right away that created a full new stream of compostable organic products that are being diverted from landfill. And that's it for the presentation. Uh, before we get into questions, so I took a couple of notes as we were going through things here and I just wanted to touch on a couple of uh, items. So compostable plastics, uh, good or bad, what do you guys think? Bad? Yeah, maybe. Um, we don't know yet. Uh, the challenge is that the systems, the composters that we have right now, that, that composter that we just built in Edmonton, it can't handle compostable plastic. Um, if you put a piece of K-cup or something else that's compostable in there, when we're finished, you're going to have a partially degraded, still mostly intact K-cup. Uh, so what it means for us is that the system needs to be designed to remove that uh, because it's basically contamination for the system. What we don't know is that, is it better environmentally in terms of its composition than these toxic plastics that we have that leach chemicals um, into our environment and into our bodies? Uh, there's a lot of uh, study that needs to be developed and a lot of technology that needs to be developed around compostable plastics, but the systems that exist right now that handle this material, they aren't set up to create compost from that. Um, blue bags. What do you do? Blue bag, blue cart, blue bin. Um, so we do blue bags too, and we recycle blue bags. 
the reason why GFL doesn't recycle blue bags, uh, and a lot of municipalities don't recycle blue bags, or don't even use them, is because bags like that and grocery bags and film plastic is one, not worth anything. We have to pay somebody to recycle the material. And two, it's very challenging in the system. Um, the machines, that disc screen that I showed you earlier, bags wrap around that. And we have to spend time every day cleaning it, uh, and that has an impact on the quality of the products. And processors, like GFL, don't like that material because it increases their operating costs. Um, yes? So, so why don't we switch to smaller blue bins? So blue bins, uh, we used to have blue bins in Edmonton, but we, so here's the thing. Technically speaking, we're not supposed to use blue bins in Edmonton, but I know people do there too. Um, and one of the reasons is that, one, they're open, they generate litter when they're being dumped, and two, if it rains, uh, it's not going to be very good recycle anymore. Um, so that was one of the primary reasons why we switched away from bins to bags. And two, understanding when that decision was made to go to bags, probably the same thing for Devon, um, we were all told that, yeah, this is fully recyclable, it's not a problem. Um, it is recyclable, but again, it's a matter of, as a municipality and as a processor, are you willing to pay more to achieve that um, can you handle financially the burden of trying to recover that material? And there's always a tipping point there about how much work do you want to do to, to recover these materials. Um, plastic, um, so plastic like a water bottle, a uh, styrofoam cup, things like that, they don't decompose, like you mentioned. They don't biodegrade over time. They just break down into smaller and smaller pieces until you've got uh, things that are so small you can't even see them, but they're still the same, largely, until they get into something that causes degradation, like if they go into an animal or a stomach. You said that the people were talking about compostable plastics. Yeah. Is, is that material actually plastic? It's, uh, it's, I forget the actual, so it's called a PLA. It's a polylactic acid, I believe. Um, it's a, again, it's a type of plastic, but it's a, it's made from organic material. Okay. Uh, I think corn. I'm making that up. <laughs> yeah. um, so why won't they make blue bags out of that? Out of compostable plastic? Because yeah. you can't recycle compostable plastic. And it, and it would get mixed in with other types of film plastic that are different resins, different types of plastic, because it would physically behave the same, and then the people that recycle film plastic would have a ton of contamination within their system. Right, so both of those are made from organic material, but compostable is supposed to be certified to break down in a compost or in a commercial compost facility. And we can put those into the green part. You, so <laughs> if you use compostable plastic, um, it's not going to turn into compost. It's going to, the system that processes the material will pull it out just like it would a garbage bag and it's going to go to either to a landfill or to a waste to energy process. Um, the difference is, and we don't really have good information about this, is what's the carbon footprint of, of creating compostable plastics or biodegradable plastics? And what's the impact on, on landfills and on, an, on the environment when you have a compostable plastic that's being disposed of in a landfill, as opposed to a fully synthetic product that's being thrown into a landfill? Do not compost. No, so you shouldn't use them. You should just put the scraps directly into the bin. So funny story. Thank you. Um, we are we're testing out organic carts in Edmonton right now. And we told everybody when we started the pilot with the 8,000 houses, we said, don't use compostable plastic bags. And everybody was not happy about that. So we are now saying it's OK to use compostable plastic bags. We'll take it and we'll deal with it. But it's important to recognize that um, we're saying that to help keep the cart clean and to help encourage participation in the program, but it's not being composted. What has the uh, skip the dishes done for the garbage back here in Edmonton? I don't know. Um, you know, there's a really good example of uh, collaboration with a company that makes the containers for HelloFresh. 
one of the, the meal planning companies where you can buy the meal and it comes in a box. Um, they, they've done a really good job of meeting with processors and, and asking them, hey, can you recycle these things? And, and those are the types of discussions that we need to have. Um, I don't have a good sense of what Skip the Dishes has done to the, to the industry. Um, the, food, the food industry, generally speaking, is in not a good place right now because takeout containers are largely non-recyclable. Most takeout containers are polystyrene or some other type of plastic that usually can't be recycled. I'm going to plead the fifth. <laughs> I don't think I can share that information because I'm pretty sure it's part of a confidential agreement we have with them. Okay. Second part of that question is, does Enerchem facility only have the capacity to handle what you guys provide to it? Or do they have the, uh, the capacity to take residue from DFLs, MRF, and other MRF? In theory, they can take um, garbage and residue from the neighboring municipalities but they're not running at 100% production yet. Um, their original model was to take about 100,000 tons per year, and Edmonton um, doesn't have that much. We're probably about 60% of that total demand. So they've got capacity, um, but they're not, they're not running enough yet that they're in a position to accept it. Is that just because they're still working out the processing? Yeah, it's... Um, Waste to energy is a, still a very new technology. The, the gasification system itself is fairly simple. Once you get the material in there, once you have that, that works pretty good. The problems that we've seen is because nobody's ever done that with garbage before. And we've, we've had a variety of technical challenges that nobody foresaw, including chemical composition, um, such as phenols impacting the wastewater that need to be cleaned and purified. Um, and we have a shredder, so the picture of the material there shreds the material down to two inches. The space between the teeth and the shredders is about the, the width of a sheet of paper, but surprisingly things like VHS tape and copper wire just go straight through, and that causes jams and problems in their system. And these are all have been learning points in their system that have delayed them from getting up and running to full production. Yeah, and if, you know, the metal wire is a good example because we, we shouldn't be throwing metal wire in the garbage. Um, that's something that we can recycle if you take it to your depots. That's, there's no reason why we can't recycle that material as long as it goes to the right place. So uh, these systems, as long as they have a, a clean product, it's very easy to operate. But as we've seen, um, that's not the case. And so they are getting better and the production's improving, but it's still, it's been a very slow process to learn how to handle it. One, one last question. Um, this uh, situation with glass, uh, it's my understanding that there has been some uses for glass in building roadbeds, but only in areas where they know that the long term of that roadbed is going to be like, like it's going to be there, it's not going to have to be you don't want to be removing all kinds of crushed glass that's a meter, meter and a half deep Yeah, I mean, that's, a, uh, that's a great point. I haven't heard of any projects, roadway projects, using glass, but in theory that there's no reason why that wouldn't work because it's, it's aggregate. It's like sand, and uh, there's no reason why you couldn't use it for something like that. Um, and that's why it's being used in sandblasting because they break it down and pulverize it until it's a fine particle. Um, but that's, that's another potential use for it. I, I haven't seen anybody doing that. Sure. I don't want to let the, the cat out of the bag, but it, it actually has been done, and it actually has produced a phenomenal roadbed that takes a massive load of heavy trucks on a daily basis, and the road is holding up better than most roads do. That's great. Um, I think the, the challenge, most municipalities, the reason why it, there's a gap right now is because if we, if we wanted to recycle glass, like say, for example, if you went to GFL and said, I really want to recycle glass, this is really important to us, then they would need to install new equipment in their facility that would be, depending on how it's set up, probably over a million dollars to buy the equipment. And then there's an ongoing operating cost to handle it as well. 
And that's why uh, a lot of operators just say, it's not worth it, it doesn't make sense. And because too, as a private operator, they're competing with other people on price. And if their price goes up, it's less likely that they're gonna be able to get somebody's business. Absolutely, and that's why uh, source separation at depots is so important because when you have a clean product like that, it's right away you can recover that and use that for, you know, for glass or for paper or any of these materials. Uh, it improves our ability to recover and use that in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. these, are they, to what extent are the separation uh, bins there that we could maybe implement here in Devon, which might include uh, Don's suggestion about the glass? Right, so we've got a bin for cardboard, a bin for paper, and a bin for containers, uh, and that's plastic and glass containers and anything else like that. Um, my recommendation when you are, if you're thinking about your configuration, is paper, cardboard, plastic, glass, and then if you want to, you could do polystyrene. It's, it's again, it's one of those things where it's a cost, it's, uh, it's an expense to do. So you don't separate the uh, recycled numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, and to that extent at those facilities? Um, if, if you don't, why would you not? Yeah, that's good. Uh, so the reason is if you, had, if you had a bin for each type of plastic, what that would do is we could take that to the recycle facility and we could just directly bail that material, but it's still gonna to go to a processor in Ontario or BC or somewhere else in the country. Um, all of our plastic is processed in, in Canada, um, but it's still, it's not being done here in Edmonton and it's getting mixed in with the other plastics. It's better because you don't have to go through the full sorting system and it's cleaner. Um, it's a, mostly a matter of how many bins do you wanna use and trying to make it a program that's friendly for your users. Yes. Taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to accept responsibility. And I think a lot of people here would be willing to accept the responsibility of doing that. But the facilities need to exist in order for us to do that. So if we can, if we can share our concerns and, and our desire to to make this a habit, to be a habit, and we can lead by example and not have to pay for these services that really should be done by ourselves. And then the extended producer responsibility is stop making this plastic, okay? So that yep. then, you know, it's it's fair for both of us to, to step up and be responsible for our actions, right? So yep. that, that to me is, is the right way to go. And I think that your examples and the, having the, the variety of options and, and is there hours of operation at these facilities? Is it 24 hours where you can drop this stuff off? Most of the facilities are Monday to Friday. Oh, you mean for the depots, for sorry, the depots. 24 hours. Right, so yeah. we can take some of that education and, and apply it here in Devon as well. So and if it doesn't need to be manned or operated by a human, because we're taking the responsibility of separating it ourselves instead of just trying to hide our garbage somewhere else. And that's one thing. The aggregate that you spoke about, there is a company in Ontario that has some technology from Germany that creates aggregate from broken glass. Mm. So the, the municipality, I think it's up in, uh, in um, Halton or, or York region, they will actually take for free broken glass. Yeah. And they will create then uh, the aggregate that would be uh, used in, in making concrete or, or uh, drywall. So it actually replaces the existing aggregate. And it, because of the glass that is broken down into these di different size balls, if you will, actually have insulating properties to them because the glass has expanded air and trapped inside the glass balls. So there is an opportunity to, to, to take that glass and do something with it. Yeah. And again, separating it at source, I think, seems to be the, the critical piece in all of what we're doing here, organics and otherwise. 
Absolutely. And one of the challenges with, with glass processing is location and accessibility to processors. Uh, there's nobody in Alberta right now, Andy mentioned somebody that's thinking about setting up, but uh, the material that gets recycled, the material from Calgary, goes to BC. And so when we talk about cost, it's mostly cost of transportation because there isn't a close option available. <laughs>